Praise the Lord. How excellent. Amen. It's been a good evening in the house of the Lord. Let's turn our hearts to the Word of God. We've been looking at the Sermon on the Mount, the Beatitudes, your best life now, right? No. What's it about? Your your blessed life now. Your blessed life now. These are the words of Christ. You got a red letter edition Bible. They're in red. I want to pay particular attention to the words of Christ. Amen. Let's pause for prayer before we look into God's word. Father, help us tonight. Thank you for the reports of praise to your name, the singing. How excellent is your name. Holy Spirit, I pray you'd be involved in the teaching tonight. Lord, may we leave here with the truth from heaven instilled within our hearts. Lord, all over this congregation, just bind our hearts together. May we be attentive to heaven. In Jesus' name, amen. Tonight we're going to look at verse 4. If you would read this with me, I'd appreciate it. Everybody out loud. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. I want to teach tonight on comfort for the crying. Comfort for the crying. If you go back to the verse here, uh, Brother Mike, but notice the words blessed and mourn. They're so contradictory, you have to ask yourself, huh? Blessed? Are they that mourn? I mean, how antithetical, I mean, how incongruent are those two words, blessed and mourn. Did you know Jesus' words have always seemed contradictory to the unspiritual? If a person has an unspiritual ear, they say that can't be. Blessed are the mourn. They that mourn. These words are foreign to the world. And sad thing is not only are they foreign to the world, they're foreign to a whole lot of the church. In fact, this beatitude addresses something that has come up missing in the church today. Something that's so needed. In fact, what's in this beatitude, blessed are they that mourn, separates the your best life now from the your blessed life now. But be that as it may, the thing that's missing in the church, and I'm not here to depress you, but to preach Christ's words, but the thing that's missing in the church is true mourning, weeping, crying. Amen. You know, babies. Know anything about babies? I thought this week, and this is just an observation, did you know people spend a whole lot of time comforting babies? From the moment they enter into the world, they demand comfort, pats and pacifiers and singing, talking to them, holding them. Babies demand comfort. Now with that in mind, I want you to keep two facts before us this evening. Number one, there's a whole lot to mourn over in this world of ours. Maybe in your world, there's a lot to mourn over. But number two, most of us aren't babies anymore. But we still have this huge need to be comforted. Even if we don't show it. Oh, I don't need to be. Oh, yeah, you do. We need to be comforted. Look at the word here, mourn. This, this is one of the strongest words in the Bible for grieving over death. Grieving over death. Grief for the one that's lost. And that's so important to know that there is comfort for those who grieve for their loss. But this message focuses on a spiritual truth rather than just that natural truth of losing and what a painful thing. But did you know we mourn for many other reasons? You, you might have heard, don't cry over spilt milk, but a lot we cry over is a lot more important than spilt milk. Isn't it? Now, you don't have to lift a hand, especially if you're one of these teenagers, but uh, uh, have you ever mourned over a bad grade? Ever cried over a bad grade? <laughs> okay. Failing grade? How many's ever lost a job? Cried some tears. How many's ever been betrayed? A best friend, someone you're in relationship with, they betrayed you. You mourned, didn't you? Breakup. 
That's a mournful time. Broke up with a boyfriend, a girlfriend. You mourned over being left out. When you was real young, you got left out of a birthday party. You get older, you get left out of something else. You mourn. Lonely, you mourn. You lose a friend, you mourn. You long for better days of your past, you mourn. Maybe you're a parent, you have a child that just won't straighten up. You mourn. You, I already had this in here, brother, brother, brother Heath, but your car engine blows up and you mourn. You got a pile of bills on your desk. You mourn. We mourn. But I want you to think about this. Listen, and then I'm going to bring this to a point. But if we consider, number one, the reason a baby mourns, and we consider that we mourn when we lose somebody, and when we consider that we mourn throughout all of life, we come to this common denominator. You know why we humans mourn? Because we're broken, messed up people living in a broken and messed up world. That is really the source of our mourning. So I want you to look at this beatitude. It's not addressing the natural, it's addressing the spiritual. What causes the brokenness in ourselves? What causes the brokenness in the world? It's sin. And so the mourning... Jesus is talking about is a mourning over sin and the brokenness and the messed upness that sin causes. But before we look at that, I want you to notice that there has to be two categories. Jesus says, blessed are they that mourn. You know what that means? There's some that don't mourn. And if we look at this beatitude, right, we'll think, well, that's good. There's some folks that don't have anything to mourn about. No, we've misunderstood this. There's those that mourn and they're blessed. And there's those that don't mourn and they're not blessed. And if you could have looked at some of Jesus' audience, you would have known he was talking about who he's talking about. There were these Pharisees and these religious folks that thought they were so spiritual and so righteous, they didn't have anything to mourn about as far as their spiritual condition. And Jesus said, if you're in that case, you'll never be blessed. When you think everything's so good in your life, everything is so righteous in your life, that you have nothing to mourn about, you'll never be blessed. But if you can look at your life and your spiritual condition and say, I've got something to mourn about... You can be blessed. I want you to hear just this one statement because I believe it's true. Did you know a person's character and a person's spiritual state can be determined by two things. What they laugh about and what they cry about. Let me say it again. A person's character and a person's spiritual state can be determined by these two things. What they laugh about and what they cry about. I want to ask you something. What do you weep about? What do you as a person cry about the story was told years ago in great britain there was a horrible train wreck and when they began to sift through the wreckage they discovered a mother who had passed away from the impact of the train but as she as as they began to look at her body she had shielded her little child within her lap and with her body shielded that child from the debris and the mother had passed away And when they reached into the mother's lap and arms and took out that little child, it was a little girl, and she'd been eating candy. She was holding some candy she was eating. And when they pulled her out from her mother, who is now dead, that little girl just laughed and giggled and just laughed and giggled. But when they reached over to take the candy from her, either to clean her up or whatever, when they took the candy away from her, she screamed and hollered and cried. Giggled. Her mother's dead. Giggled. She's taken from her mother's embrace. But she cries when her candy's taken from her. Our character and spiritual nature is determined and revealed by what we laugh about, what we cry about. So what is this mourning that Jesus was talking about? Blessed are they that mourn. I believe it's of a spiritual nature. And so first of all, I believe it's a mourning over my sin. Did you know one of the most difficult things in spiritual leadership, one of the most difficult things today is to get Christians to see that anything is wrong. Christians to see that anything is sin. 
My wife made a statement the other morning. She said, you talk to most Christians today, and they act like the only thing that sin is doing drugs or murdering somebody or something like that. Have you noticed that? Nobody thinks anything they're doing, anything of their life is wrong. I mean, I, 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 have, I have heard of, of, of people watching a filthy movie on Netflix and then justify and say, well, I didn't see anything wrong with it. Have you noticed that? What I'm trying to say is a real spiritual person, they find cause to mourn over sin in their life. I know there's forgiveness. I know, thank God. And that's part of the blessedness. But someone who is truly spiritual has come to the place that they mourn over sin in their life. Do you remember when Jesus... And I'm not going to go into the story, but Jesus told Peter, you're going to deny me. And old Peter said, oh, no, I'll never deny you. I'll, I'll, they'll kill me first. And Jesus said, before that cock crows, you'll deny me three times. Do you remember that story? What happened after Peter denied the Lord and the rooster sounded off? What did the Bible say Peter did? He went out and he wept bitterly. He mourned. Over his sin. I'm not talking about coming to the place we live under condemnation. That's not what the message is about. The message is a truly spiritual heart is one that mourns over what's wrong with them spiritually. And Jesus said that person will be blessed. Now I want to tell you something that's completely contrary to what you'll hear in churches today. It's not the message you'll hear. But I want you to know it's Jesus' message. He's talking to his disciples. Learn to mourn. Secondly, what do we mourn about? We mourn over the sin of God's people. Listen, I'm totally aghast at this. First of all, that church has supported a deviant lifestyle according to the Bible. But then they supported the same-sex marriage. But the thing that is most disturbing about it, there were churches who rejoiced at that ruling. And it's just, it's just symptomatic of things that we see all over. Churches will rejoice under this theme. We've been liberated. It doesn't matter anymore. We can, you know, we can, we can be like the world around us and still be saved, and they'll rejoice over that. Did you know all through the Bible, it's replete with folks, when they saw that the people of God, I'm thinking of Israel, began to be like the world around them, the nations around them, the true people of God began to weep and to cry and say, look, is, look what's happening to God's people. They mourned. We rejoice over inroads of the world into the church. Yet there, you look, you read it. There was a time when the prophets mourned that God's people had adopted the ways of the tribes around them. Think of Jeremiah, the weeping prophet. Daniel. But if you need any other picture, think of Jesus. Looking at the panorama of Jerusalem and weeping over that city that killed the prophets. Weeping. Paul. Weeping, mourning. How many believes, and I'm not being critical, I'm just trying to preach what Jesus said. How many believes there is cause for us to mourn over what shape the people of God are in? Can we not mourn over the shape the church is in? And then, last of all, it's a mourning over the sin of our nation, the world. I'm highly disappointed, I'm highly frustrated. But you know what? A lot of what I see from the church in response to the evil of our nation and the, the, uh, the degradation of our nation, much of what I see is anger. And I understand that frustration. But when you hear from the, the people of God, it's a venting of anger that's almost like venom. It's a bitterness and an anger. How many things would be a much better response instead of simply a venting of anger? We wept over the condition of our nation. Oh no, let's get up in arms. Let's, you know, let's get him. Let's, you know, pretty soon we're just like them. Tar and feather and burn them at the stake. Right? 
What would the response be if God's people across this land would weep over the condition of our nation? Sin's destroying our nation. Sin's destroying the people in it. And I'm not, I'm not here to be divisive, but politics are not the answer for the problem our nation has. Our nation needs revival and awakening. And anger will never bring an awakening and revival. But weeping over our nation will. The psalmist said in 119, Rivers of water run down mine eyes because they keep not thy law. You know, the world mourns. The world mourns when life is rough and hard and ugly. But the believer mourns over what makes life ugly and hard. That's the difference. It's kind of like for, on all of these. It's kind of like, you ever got a speeding ticket? Ticket. Some of you cried when you got one, didn't you? Anyone get one this week? Now, when you were crying over that speeding ticket... Were you crying over the fine or were you crying over the fact you had broken the law? Right? And the world cries over the fine, but the believer should cry over breaking the law in the analogy. Maybe not in the analogy. I broke the laws of the land, I'm a criminal. Where is the comfort? Now, Jesus said, blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Where is the comfort? Well, I could just simplify it and say the comfort is God. Notice what it says in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 3. Blessed be the God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercy, the God of all comfort. How many has discovered He is the God of all comfort? It's His nature to comfort. He don't have to say, I'm going to try to comfort Brother Cruz. His nature is such that Brother Cruz is in his presence. God will be comforting him. It's his presence to comfort. Aren't you glad for that? And I, I just want to break it down quickly for us. But where is that comfort? Blessed are they that more if they shall be comforted. Where is that comfort? That comfort is in salvation. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Notice what it says in 2 Corinthians chapter 7. For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, but the sorrow of the world worketh death. The sorrow of the world worketh death. Godly sorrow worketh repentance. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be saved. I'll tell you why you're going to be comforted if you mourn over sin. Because you'll be saved. Isn't it a comfort to know you're saved, whatever is happening? And then secondly, are, where is that comfort? Blessed are they that mourn. They show, it's in the Holy Spirit. Lots of scriptures here. You guys already know that Jesus said, I'll send you another comforter. But I, I wanted you to look at just one verse. It's from the book of Acts, verse 9. And it's just a description of the churches. But listen to what it says. Then had the churches rest throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria and were edified, walking in the fear of the Lord. And what else did the churches have? And the comfort of the Holy Ghost. Blessed are they that mourn because the Spirit will work in their life. And the Spirit brings comfort. Have you ever been there dismayed, discouraged, depressed, weeping and crying? And the Holy Spirit moved across your heart. Aren't you glad for the Comforter? We, we sing a song, the Comforter has come. The Comforter has come. Where is that comfort? It's in the Scriptures. I appreciate a people that love the Word of God. Even what we're doing on a Wednesday night, because we're living in a, in a time when people don't really want the Word. They want a motivational speech speech and so you pull a, a little fragment out but i want you to know there's real comfort in knowing what the scriptures say amen look what it says in romans 15 for whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our leaning that we through patient and comfort of the scriptures might have hope there's comfort in the scriptures we need the Word of God. I was telling Brother Brian, I, I couldn't remember, but somebody had put on, on Facebook 
remember this. And if you were ever a part of the Assemblies of God, their youth group was called Christ Ambassadors. We even had our own song. It was, it was fancy, too. And, 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 but there was, a, there was a pledge that you took. And I, I could remember all of it. But one is, you would say, I pledge to read my Bible daily. Oh, that's important. Why? There's comfort in the Scriptures. And then there's comfort in the saints. Amen? you got to watch whom you talk to. It's like that man that crawled out on the bridge. He was going to jump off, commit suicide. Life was cruel and ugly, and he's through. And they sent a psychologist out there to talk him with him and he went out there and they talked for an hour and a half and then they both jumped (laughs) you got to watch who you hang around and talk to but did you know when you come together with God's people with the saints of God did you know there's comfort in that I promise you if you were really engaged in church tonight in the testimonies in the words that were sung and said if you were really engaged with God's people tonight you're going to leave here encouraged God's built it into his people the saints are comforting How much comfort can you get from the folks of the world Amen it's comforting when we come together as the saints of God Where's the comfort those are things where the comfort comes from now But blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. That also includes tomorrow. Heaven. Oh, that description of heaven in Revelation 21. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. And there shall be no more death, neither sorrow, nor crying. Neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. Blessed are they that mourn. You may weep the whole way, but you won't weep when you get there. Blessed are they that mourn. Aren't you glad there's comfort in God? Now, I want to tell you this. I'm going to close in just a moment. I truly believe that if our hearts will mourn, mourn over our own sins, mourn over the people of God's sin, mourn over our... I believe if we'll mourn, we've got a week and a half, But I believe if we as a people of God will begin to mourn, I believe we'll see a revival like we have never seen before. Blessed are they that mourn. You know, sometimes we can get age specific. You know, it would be wonderful if these young people just begin to weep and cry for the way young people's lives are messed up. Years ago, I saw a nine-year-old interceding for the people of the world, weeping and crying in an altar. One of the most moving things I ever heard, just begin to intercede that God would save people across. Nine years old, weeping and crying. Oh, what a moving thing it was. Many times they look more like altar benches. You may not know what this is. We're going way back now. But when revivals came to America, many churches had what was called a mourner's bench. This was a, really one of those. It's not a replica And notice how on the back of it, it says the way of the transgressor is hard. And I I could tell you what it is, but I just want to give you the definition. A mourner's bench is a bench or seat at the front of the church or another room in the church set apart for the mourners or repentant sinners seeking salvation. Churches used to have a mourning bench. That's a... That's a great rarity today. And I know because of the design of our sanctuary and the lack of room, we don't have altar benches, but they used to have altar benches. That's where you went and you mourned. It was a place to mourn, a mourner's bench. Amen. Having gotten rid of the mourner's bench, we discovered we also got rid of rejoicing because it was the mourner's bench that led to the rejoicing. Amen. We sang this the other night. I don't know if anyone caught it. We were seeing a meeting in the air. It said, there'll be no mourning bench there. Remember that? No mourning bench. But I think we still need it. Don't you? Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Could you stand? Amen. Go ahead, music. I failed to ask you to come. Whoever's doing the music, go ahead and come tonight.
I know perhaps this is a message that came in teaching form, and perhaps it's something that needs to percolate a while. But you know, it would be a fitting altar call from what Jesus said just to say, Church, let's come and cry. Let's come and cry. Blessed are they which mourn, for they shall be comforted. That turns everything the world says up on end. But because Jesus said it, it's true. Amen. Would you come find a place to pray tonight?